Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bayshore, 1030 Millsboro. So good to see you guys. I just came from Femic Island. The campus here is doing so good. And uh, you guys look great today. What a great group we got here today. So th- hope you're having a great week, and it's good to see you. If you're a first-time guest here, I'm Pastor Danny, and we're just so glad you're here. We give our first-time guests a big hand. Thank you for coming today. So glad you came. Whoever invited you, we're so thankful you're here. And I just am so thankful I get to do this. It's such an honor to work with such great people here at Bayshore and our media team in the back and our staff. We just got such a great team and all our volunteers. So thank you guys so much. We are doing a series this summer called Be Happy. And uh, this is the 103rd section of that message, I think. We've been doing this a while, but we'll finish up in about two weeks. This is, uh, we've taken one book this summer to study, and that's the book of Philippians. And we've been talking about the idea of being happy. And uh, the big theme in the book of Philippians is learning to be content, be happy, whatever your circumstances are. That's the big theme. Today we're going to be talking about a sub-theme. There's actually two themes in the book of Philippians. The main theme is to be joyful in the midst of struggles and difficulty and to be happy. Paul's in prison when he writes this. But there's another theme that sort of runs underneath of this, and that is the theme of unity. Unity. There's a little bit of disunity in the church of Philippi. There's some problems in some relationships, and uh, we kind of know that from reading the end of chapter, uh, well, when we get to chapter 4, which is the last chapter in the book, we get to Philippians 4, 2, and 3, and Paul kind of lays out something's going on in the church, and he says something about it. Philippians 4, 2, and 3, he says, I plead with, that's a heartfelt expression. He's burdened. He's pleading with these. He pleads with Yoda, and I plead with Syndicate to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, you, my true companion, help these women since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul writes to uh, the, this church here, and there's some ladies in the church, Yoda and Syndicate, aren't getting along. They got a relationship struggle. Now, when you think about this a little bit, how this really played out, um, in the ancient world, about 10% of the people were literate, about 10%. So that means 90% of the people in the church couldn't read. Now, if you go to, the, uh, if you go to outside areas of the country, even less than that can read. So this is not like they passed out Paul's letter and everybody read it. That's not how it happened. How it really happened was uh, Epaphroditus, who's the guy that's mentioned in the book, he's gone to Rome and gave Paul some money and food to help take care of him, to support him from the church of Philippi. He comes back with the letter to the church. They're all gathered together, and uh, Epaphroditus reads the letter out loud to the gathered church. So that's how it happened. It wasn't like, hey, you know, get a chance to read Paul's letter. It's really good. It's like they had a church service and they read the book of Philippians and you're sitting there and then you get to chapter four. There wasn't chapters in that time, but you get to the end of the letter and Paul says, I urge Yoda and Syndicate to get along with each other. Now, can you imagine the heads turning Looking over there, Yoda and Syndicate, they were probably sitting on separate sides of the church. And he named them by name because they had some conflict in their relationship. So this is an interesting thing. So Paul kind of deals with that out front, deals with the situation about Syndicate and Utica having problems in their relationship. Now, uh, I was watching 60 Minutes last night on Paramount, and uh, there was a deal on there. I don't know if it was from last Sunday, but it was uh, about Bruce Springsteen and his co-lead singer and guitarist, Stephen Van Zandt. How many of you know who Bruce Strings, uh, Springsteen is? You know who he is, right? You know, born in the USA. Uh, his buddy, uh, Stephen uh, Van Zandt, started the East, uh, band, the East Street Band with him years ago, and they were friends. But in 1984, there was a conflict. And what happened was, uh, the New York Post wrote an article on this, what happened was that uh, Bruce Springsteen brought in a new manager for the band, and Stephen had been the main advisor up to that point, and he was kind of excluded, and he felt overlooked and was upset about it, and in 1984, he left the band, even though he and Bruce Springsteen were good friends. 
They split. Although they'd started the band together, they were good friends. They had a division in the relationship. And uh, so uh, Stephen, Van, uh, Stephen Van Zant went out, had his own band, put his own album out. And he put an album out right before Born in the USA came out. Uh, and so Bruce Springsteen was kind of climbing his uh, apex. And uh, there was a division in that relationship because of a management issue in the band. So Stephen Van Zant started his own band, had a new, had a, his own album, and then he uh, starred on Sopranos. He was in the Sopranos, if you remember the Sopranos. How many ever watched the Sopranos? I'm not going to have some of you watch the Sopranos. Uh, a little too rough for me, but I, did, I, I, think it's, I think it's probably a good show. A lot of people watch it. So anyhow, uh, that all happened in 1984. Fifteen years later, there's a reconciliation and these two guys come back together. And when I watched the 60-minute interview, they were performing in Rome, and uh, they were getting ready to go out, and they put their arms around each other, and, they, and, and uh, Bruce Springsteen said, it's such an honor to perform every night with my best friend. Really interesting story. I didn't know that. I didn't know that about Bruce Springsteen. I didn't know that about that division, so it's very interesting. But in the church of uh, Philippi, there's a division between two people. Now, here's what we, uh, we don't know. We don't know what they were fighting about. We have no idea what the division was about. We don't know what they were arguing about. We don't know what they were fighting about. We just know that they were at odds with each other, and we do not know the issue. Now, I would like to know the issue. I don't know if they were jealous of each other. I don't know if there was a disagreement about church doctrine. I don't know if it was a disagreement about some policy in the church. I don't know if it was personal that they just didn't get along. Their temperaments were different. One was merciful. One was overbearing. I don't know. We don't know what they were fighting about. Maybe the message there is, is the relationship sometimes is more important than the issue. The relationship is sometimes more important than the issue. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes the relationship is more important than the issue. The other thing we don't know is we don't know if they ever got straightened out. We don't know if they ever responded to Paul's message. We don't know if they ever got united. We don't know if they, when they heard Paul's message and the book of Philippians was read to them, we don't know if they made up and it all worked out. Paul never let us know, and we do not know. And I think that's interesting. Some relationships are unresolved, and we don't know what happens to those relationships. And we have those issues in our life. What we do know about them, we don't know what the issue was. We don't know if they made up. What we do know is they were Christians. They were devoted to Jesus. They were Jesus followers. Here's the big point, number one point in the message. Christians can have conflict with each other. Christians can have conflict with each other. People that go to church together can have conflict with each other. That is a reality. And it is, if you come to church and you're kind of a Pollyannish in your view, hey, these are all wonderful people. Everybody loves Jesus. Nobody's ever going to have an argument. Everybody's always going to get along. You're going to be disillusioned because you can't be disillusioned unless you have an illusion. And to think that people always get along is an illusion. I remember listening to uh, Mark Rutland, great preacher, uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, and he was college president in a number, uh, pl number of schools. He said he was riding through uh, Georgia one time, and he saw a little church on the side of the road, and it was called Harmony Church. He thought, wow, what a great name for a church. I'd like to go to Harmony Church. He rode a little further along, and he saw another church, New Harmony Church. <laughs> well, listen, don't be naive about people. 2,000 years ago, there was a church planted by the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament, and the church that he oversaw and the church that he was uh, the leader of and giving oversight to had a personal conflict in the church. And the book of uh, Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. People have difficulty. We know that they were Christians, and then we know that they didn't get along. They had problems in their relationship. We also know that they were not nominal Christians. They were devoted Christians. They were, they were Marines spiritually. They were, they, Paul said, these women labored at my side. They helped me plant the church. They're there. They're praying. They're preaching. They're sharing their faith. They are in the trenches with Paul and with Clement, who's another church leader. 
So these are not just sort of lightweight Christians, but they're solid Christians. So in a good church planted by the Apostle Paul, there was some difficulty in relationships there. I remember I was preaching in Germany a number of years ago when I was a young pastor. I got to go to Germany like three times to preach, and I was on a, like a mission tour over there preaching in different churches. And I remember one Sunday night preaching at a church somewhere in Germany. It was a, a modern church. I remember the stage was very modern. It was very much before churches were very modern. Very modern stage, great-looking uh, auditorium. Uh, wasn't as church wasn't near as big as this church, but I remember preaching. I'm preaching to a translator, and I'm preaching on forgiveness, the importance of forgiving. Uh, one of the few messages I had that I like could preach anywhere, and I talked about aphemi as the word for forgiveness. It means to let go, and I'm preaching about forgiveness through the translator, and in the middle of my message, in the corner of the church, there's a man that stood up, a German man that stood up. If you know German people, they're like very kind of black and white, you know, This guy stood up and he said, I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, brother, in the middle of my sermon. And there's a guy sitting on the front row. Is the pastor. He stood up and these two had a conversation over the the congregation during my, while I was trying to preach my message. I stopped my message, of course. And the guy in the back was the landlord that owned the building that the church met in. And there had been a falling out between him and the pastor. And they actually walked toward each other in front of the congregation, and they embraced, and they hugged, and they cried, and they forgave each other. Now, I just have to say, it really threw me off. I mean, I'm just trying to preach my message. You know what I mean? I'm just preaching. You know, I'm not, like, expecting anything to happen here, you know? And, uh, but those guys reconciled. And there was a church, good church, that had trouble in the church because there was divisions. Happens happens. People like are so naive about that. People are people are people. People that love Jesus are still people. People that love Jesus still are dysfunctional. People that love Jesus still have baggage. So we're just people. And uh, so that's what happened in this church. And so if you read the book of Philippians, you'll see throughout the book, there's these little breadcrumbs of hints that there's division in the church. For instance, Paul writes in Philippians 1, 9, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. So in the, right in the beginning, he's saying, I'm praying you guys love each other because there was some love not going on there. Philippians 1, 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about it in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So if you read the book of Philippians, you'll see Paul cheerleading these people to get along the whole time. Here's the truth, though. All of us, or I would say at least most of us, have had some strained relationships. We've had some relationships that were one time were pretty good, maybe were great, like Bruce Springsteen and his, uh, his uh, co-singer there. Maybe you've had some good relationships, and that relationship somehow got strained, and there were difficulty. And the difficulty in the relationship, it happens in churches, it happens in businesses, it happens in partnerships, it happens in families, where there's problems in relationships. And for me, it's very, very painful. For me, this is not like a theoretical sermon because I've experienced some of that, and you've experienced some of that. So that is a painful thing. So I want to just talk a little bit about that. What about these relationships? What causes relationships to go off of the rails? Uh, Well, a couple things that could happen, and uh, there's just about four things that I think could maybe you know, make relationships go off the rails. And I'm going to talk about some solutions of how you need to look at failed relationships. Now, the first thing that can cause relationships to go off off the rails is pressure. It's pressure. When people are under pressure, they get edgy. When people are under pressure, they they get edgy. Now, the church, what we do know about the church of Philippi is that they were under pressure. Now, why do we know that they were under pressure? We know they were being persecuted just the way Paul was. First Philippians 1, 29 through 30. For it has been granted on you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, you're going through the same thing I went through. You're being persecuted. So pressure causes people 
to get at each other's throat when there's pressure, when you get a couple that's newly married and, and they got they start having kids and they got a bunch of kids and maybe the money's a little tight and, and they don't have as much sleep as they used to have and, and they don't have a, a, an avenue to get refreshed and so they're, they're with those kids all the time and there's pressure and there's jobs and something happened at work and all that and then you got a young family under pressure and then that pressure causes them to start, to start fighting with each other. Pressure will expose our weaknesses. And so I wonder if part of what's going on in the church of Philippi is that they're under incredible external pressure and their external pressure outside of the church and it's causing internal conflict because the external pressure on the outside. So that's something for you to think about. We all have that at different times. Mervyn Brenneman says this, external pressure amplifies internal weakness. External pressure amplifies internal weakness. Karen and I love to watch the Amazing Race show. We're on the last episode, uh, last season on Paramount. Uh, we didn't watch that show for years, and we started watching that show. Like it a lot. And it shows all these people. They start in Los Angeles somewhere. They travel around the world. They have to cr- cr- complete these different tasks. And these people start out at the starting line. They're so excited. They're so happy. They just can't believe they're on the Amazing Race. And then you, they show them in France or Romania or somewhere, and they're lost, and they can't find directions, and they're yelling at each other in the and they're getting ugly with each other and they're just you know just saying you're just the biggest idiot in the world and the pressure exposes the weaknesses in their personality so that's one of the things that can happen and whenever you are under pressure and you see your ugly side emerge it's like the refiner of gold a refiner of gold will burn the pot of gold, will melt the, the gold, and the impurities come to the top, and then the refiner will take off the impurities until he can see his face in the gold. So when you're going through pressure and you see your ugly side, how many here have ever got a little not so on your best moment when you're under pressure? I wish I didn't have that anymore. I still have that. Uh, can happen in a sports competitive thing. Or, you know, uh, you know, some things come out of us sometimes. And it's, it's a good thing because it shows us what we need to work on. So pressure can cause conflict in relationships. Here's another thing. It's being self-centered. This is a big one, being self-centered. Now, that sounds harsh, doesn't it? But I believe this. I believe that all relationships that break down involve ego. When we are self-centered about something in a relationship and our relationship is about ourselves and getting our own way and always wanting our way, we're going to have conflict with people. The great story in Genesis 14 where Abraham and Lot, were their herdsmen were fighting over the flocks and the pasture land. And Abraham said, this is a great story in uh, in uh, Genesis 14, Abraham said, Lot, whatever you want, you go whatever way you want to. And, and Abraham was a peacemaker. Now, now, there's times to be assertive. There's times to set boundaries. But if your life is governed by always getting your way about things, you're going to have conflict with people a lot. The book of James says that the reason we have quarrels and fights is selfishness. So that means that when I'm fighting with Karen, somebody's being selfish, and I pretty much guarantee it's me. <laughs> James 4, 1, 3 says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes fights and quarrels? Well, we want to know. That's what we're asking. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not do it because you do not, you do, you do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James says when there's conflict in relationship, always look to see if self is on the throne. Self is on the throne. When Karen and I first got married, we celebrated our 47th this last Monday. We had a great time, went out to... Uh, dinner in Ocean City on Monday night, uh, and I, I usually play tennis on Monday night. I felt led to cancel that. So anyhow, I, uh, we went out and had a great dinner, and then we went to the boardwalk, Ocean City boardwalk. We haven't been on the boardwalk on years on Ocean City boardwalk. 
So we went to dumpsters and got a chocolate milkshake. How many know that dumpster chocolate milkshakes is the best chocolate milkshake there's ever been made? Dairy Queen is drivel compared to that. How many have ever had a dumpster chocolate milkshake? It's amazing. If you put a little bit on your forehead, your, brain, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to that, you know? It's that good. So we walked on the boardwalk, we had a great time, and our son, his birthday was the next day, and so we bought him something at the surf shop there. By the way, he wasn't born the day after we got married. He was born <laughs> four years later, so just so you, I, I could see some of the people calculating. He hasn't always followed Jesus, you know. Uh, but when we got married, I was 19, Karen was 20, and I was a self-oriented, just, I don't know, I just, I know the word I want to say, but I shouldn't say in church, you know. I thought she was created to make me happy. And I wanted my way about everything. And I was the oldest child, and I was the prima donna of my family. She was the youngest in her family, and she was spoiled, and I was spoiled. And so we had really, really bad time our first year. It was terrible. We fought all the time. We didn't fight sometime. We fought all the time. Everybody knew we were fighting. We just didn't get along. And so we moved to Florida, and that helped us because we got away from all of our family. We had to go down there and survive on our own. We didn't know anybody, and I went to school. She got a job at a dental assistant, uh, was it as a dental assistant at a dental office, and we're trying to learn how to be married. And I remember, uh, you know, the first time she got sick, uh, she got the flu. And I, I just have to tell you, Karen is a knockout. She's beautiful. When she was young, I mean, it just I got whiplash first time I saw her, you know. And I married her. She was so beautiful and is beautiful. But I remember the first time she got sick. And, and we're in, living in this mobile trailer, a mobile home. And she's in the bed. And she's getting nauseous. And she tries to run toward the bathroom to throw up. And she doesn't make it. And she throws up on the carpet. And then she gets back in bed, and I'm thinking, what happens now? What happens now? <laughs> and it was shag carpet, if I can use your imagination there. <laughs> and uh, I, when, I was a little, when I was a young boy and I got sick, and my mom, you know, they, she loved me. I was the best thing ever happened. She'd, I'd be kneeling on the floor, throwing up, and she'd be dabbing my forehead with a little wet rag. And, and uh, that's how I was raised. And I thought, where's mama now? You know, what's going to happen now? And I had to clean that up. And I learned at that moment, that's what marriage is about. Marriage is, thank God for sex and excitement and dating. and all. It's all wonderful. But that's what marriage is about. It's the university of selflessness. Learning to be selfless. And we over the years have grown and become more mature and, and less selfish and giving our life to Jesus more and letting him be the Lord of our life. So I would not say we never, ever argue. I would be lying if I said we never argue, but we hardly argue very much at all anymore. It's because Karen's always been more selfless than I have, but I've tried to meet her, and selfishness causes trouble in relationships, always wanting your way. And relationships are about surrendering. It's about being flexible. And related to selfishness is immaturity. Immaturity is when you can only see the world through your eyes. Maturity is when you have evolved to the place in your life where you can look at the world from somebody else's perspective, and you may not come to the same conclusion, but you hear them, like James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. You listen to them, and Stephen Covey says, you know, seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. When you learn to do that, it very much diminishes conflict in relationships. Relationships can also be caused, trouble in relationships can also be caused by jealousy and envy. And I would say that nobody ever admits that they're jealous. And jealousy always comes out of, uh, out of a sense of insecurity. 
Insecure people are prone to being jealous. So if I find somebody that they're struggling with jealousy, I know that there's insecurity there. They're not secure in who they are. They're not secure in their own skin. They're not secure in their own mission. And so they're jealous. About 30 to 50 times in the New Testament talks about, about jealousy. I wonder in the church of uh, Philippi, Yoda and Syndicate, I wonder if there's some jealousy there. Maybe, maybe Syndicate, she's getting to teach Sunday school a bit more. Or maybe people are just coming up to her and saying, boy, I tell you what, you are the best teacher. And sometimes, you know, if you have your mind connected to the spotlight, that you need the spotlight to feel good about yourself, then you can become jealous. There's a Oscar Wilde, the uh, famous author, tells this story about the devil traveling across the Libyan desert. And there's this, he comes across this holy man, this monk, the demons are trying to tempt. The demons are trying to get him to, to, to give into the flesh, and they're tormenting this holy man. And this holy man is staying so holy and so focused. And Oscar Wilde, on his little story, says that he says to the demons, he said, let me show you something. And he goes and whispers in the ear of the holy man, he says, your brother has been made a bishop in Alexandria. And Oscar Wilde's story says that there's a fiendish and angry look that comes upon the face of the holy man. There's a book by R.T. Kendall called Jealousy, the Sin Nobody Talks About. So you got to, it's a wonderful book. I doubt anybody will buy it or read it. It's such an offensive title because nobody ever wants to admit they're jealous. But if you are struggling with, you know, maybe someone else getting more attention. And here's where it really plays out in real life. It plays out in sibling rivalry in families. If you look at the book of Genesis, you'll find in the book of Genesis that there's very dysfunctional families there. You've got Isaac married to, to Rebecca. Rebecca favors Jacob, and Isaac favors Esau. And there's jealousy between Esau and Jacob, and that goes on for years until Esau and Jacob had a major division in their relationship. So jealousy is a problem. Here's, a, here's another one. Disagreement about what to do. Disagreement what to do. Now, there's a great story in the book of Acts, Acts 15. Acts 15, the end of the, the chapter, we have Paul and we have Barnabas, these two giants in the church. And Paul said, you know, to Barnabas one day, let's go back and visit the church as we planted on our first missionary journey. And, and John Mark had bailed on him the first time. That was Barnabas' cousin. We're talking about blood relationship here. And so what happened here is uh, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along with him. Paul didn't think it wise because he quit on him on the first time. And it says they had such a sharp division. The apostle Paul, who wrote 13 chapters in the New Testament, and Barnabas had such a falling out that they went their separate ways. John Mark went with Barnabas to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and they went on the second missionary journey. And we do not know if Barnabas and Paul ever shook hands again. It's not in the New Testament. But what we do know is that late in Paul's life, he said, bring John Mark to me because he's helpful for me in the ministry. And so Paul went on. Here's the thing. Paul went on. They disagreed probably because of temperament. Paul is like, let's charge, let's plant churches. Barnabas is more nurturing, and that, by the way, happens in marriages. you got a, you got one parent that says... You know, got to be tough, got to teach them to be strong and all that. And then you got the other one that's nurturing. You always have a strong and a nurturing parent. And you got to learn to balance those things. You know, and uh, anyhow, that's another sermon. But Paul goes on, plants churches. Barnabas takes John Mark and pours his life into him. So what's the net result of that? Paul plants, goes two more missionary journeys, ends up in Rome. He plants his dozens of churches. He writes 13 letters. God blesses Paul. But also, John Mark is being mentored by Barnabas. 
And he loves him and he encourages him. And John Mark goes to Rome and he ends up working with Peter and he listens to Peter preach. And Papus, one of the early church fathers, says that John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark listening to Peter's sermons. So the gospel, how many know that you got the gospel of Mark in your Bible? Are you grateful for the gospel of Mark? That came because there was a split. God works in our discord. Would you say it with me? God works in our discord. So you got that going on. And I could tell you why I think that happened. But then the last category. So you got jealousy, you got selfishness, you got, you got pressure. Then you got disagreement. And then some relationships struggle because of the person is a toxic person. A person is very, very difficult. Now, I used to have this view of life, and I used to have this view of Scripture. I used to have this view of relationships, and the view was that if you do everything right in a relationship, you can heal any relationship. And, uh, you know, the bombshell theory that's in uh, AA, uh, I can change no one by direct, op- uh, by direct action, but others have a tendency to change as I change. I used to think that if I changed and if I was loving and praying and supportive and serving, I could heal any relationship. That's not true. That's not true. Sometimes you can do everything in your power to heal a relationship, but there is not humility on the other side to make that relationship work. Here's what has to happen in any broken relationship. There has to be humility on both sides. It doesn't mean that it's 50-50 responsibility, but it means that every person in a broken relationship has to embrace humility, and they have to say, you know what, I was wrong about these things, and I am sorry. Or maybe I was just wrong that I had a wrong reaction. I didn't really do anything wrong, but I had a wrong reaction. Where there's humility, God works, but where there's sort of like resisting and saying, I'm not going to receive or I haven't done anything wrong, then you're going to have trouble in that relationship. And here's what you do. I was reading, here's how it happened for me. Because I have a thinking, I've thought about these things for so many years. I was reading one day in Genesis. And I got to Genesis 32 where Jacob and Esau had been separated for 20 years and Jacob's coming back and Esau's coming to meet him and Jacob's praying all night and to protect him from Esau's anger. And Esau's coming with 340 men, but uh, Jacob sends these gifts ahead, these herds and flocks. And then the wonderful picture in, in Genesis 32, you see Jacob and Esau Jacob's bowing down before Esau. He's serving him. He's loving him. And then they embrace and there's reconciliation. Then I saw, oh my goodness, any relationship can be healed, which is true. But if you read the story, I kept reading, and then it says that Esau said to Jacob, come on, let's go live in Seir. We're going to live in Seir, which is uh, modern day Ed- oh, it's Edom, it was called Edom as well. Let's go live in Seir. And Jacob said, well, I can't travel that fast because I got kids and I got all these flocks and herds. He said, but I'll go ahead and meet you there. I'll meet you there. And Jacob uh, and Esau goes to Seir. But if you read Genesis 32, Jacob never goes to Seir. He never goes to Seir. He goes to Shechem. He told him he was going to go, but he didn't go. Because Jacob realized that this was a relationship that was so toxic, that Esau was so difficult that he needed to keep distance from that person. He had a connection with him. He forgave him. He loved him, but he didn't go live in the same town with him. And so that's a principle. Say this with me. Some relationships require distance. Say it one more time. Some relationships require distance. For me, what that means is I will love and forgive everybody in my heart. But maybe there are some few people, handful, very small handful of people in this world that my heart loves them and forgives them from a distance, but I have to keep distance 
because of the toxicity or the dysfunctionalness of the relationship. It's a very important principle there, how to live that out. So when I was a kid growing up, uh, my first friend, I've told you this story before, my first friend was Henry Lee Henry, a little boy lived across the, lived across the field in a farmhouse and First day we met, we're like seven or eight years old, and I'm sitting in the ditch on one side of the road. He's sitting in the ditch on the other side of the road. We just kind of threw dirt chunks at each other, and that was the beginning of our relationship. He went home, I went home, and then we got together, and we started playing at his farm. And one day after school, there was a big dirt pile where they were building a house in the woods, and Henry Lee and Henry and I went and got on that dirt pile. He got on one side, I got on the other side, and we had a dirt chunk fight. How many have ever had a dirt chunk fight? Man, that's seriously fun, isn't it? Then after we had a dirt chunk fight for a while, I said to Henry, let's build a tunnel through the top of this dirt pile. You get on one side, and I'll get on the other side. And I took a stick, and he took a stick, and we started digging, and we got our little arms up to our shoulders, and we're pulling the dirt out of that tunnel and it's the most exciting thing in the world and finally there was a breakthrough and our fingers touched and we had made the tunnel all the way through and it's a fun thing for a little eight or nine year old boy to experience to experience the the fingers of your friend on the other side of that dirt pile and years later I thought about that and I realized that that's what's required in reconciliation of relationships that on each side of our issues We have to deal with our own dirt. And when you've got one person on one side dealing with their dirt, and you've got another person on their side dealing with their dirt, then you can have reconciliation. And when you've got somebody that says, you know what, i got some dirt on my side and I want to deal with it, but what you can never do is to deal with your dirt and then climb over the hill and deal with their dirt. You can only deal with your dirt. So... I'm grateful, grateful that Paul said, tell Yoda and Syndicate to get along with each other. I'm grateful for that. It shows me the reality of life, and we don't know what happened. You know, in 1913, and I'm about ready to close here, 1913, 50 years from when Gettysburg battle started, Uh, There was a reunion of 50,000 people that came to Gettysburg. Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers that were still living, and they were dying out real quickly. So they brought these two armies together. And uh, Woodrow Wilson gave a great speech about forgiveness. And then you got this beautiful scene where they take some of the soldiers. there's There's a stone wall, and the Union soldiers retired Union soldiers and the retired Confederate soldiers stand on the side of that wall and they shake hands. This happened in history. And I believe that when we get to heaven, we don't know if Yoda and Syndicate ever made up. I hope they did. But there's some people out here, you got some hanging relationships that haven't been resolved. And I don't know how the story ends. But I know one day, people that love Jesus, even that disagreed, even that had trouble, one day, it's better to do it now, one day we'll all be reunited. Last thing I'll say. Do you know who the person is going to be your neighbor in heaven? The person that's going to be your neighbor and neighbors in heaven are the people that you've had the most trouble with here on the earth. How many already know who's going to be living on your street? (laughs) Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is divine, omnipotent, a person. He's been speaking in the ears of people, comforting people today, people that are grieving over relationships they can't heal. Father, we ask you to release these people. Paul said in Romans, I've done everything when you've done everything you can to live at peace with all. You've done what I've called you to do. 
Father God, we pray that you'll restore relationships that should be restored, relationships that we need to keep a distance from to protect ourselves. Give us wisdom for that. And Lord, regardless of what has happened in the past, regardless of all the disappointments in relationships, we're grateful that you're Lord of our life and you have a wonderful, powerful future for us. We pray your blessing on us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. 